so it, it's um should i talking to here okay yeah all right, so our next speaker is Dr. John Cause, and it's a really great pleasure to introduce John. I feel that I'm justified in saying he is probably, he is the top um, c comparative neuroanatomist and neuroscientist in, in the world, and so we're really lucky to have him. John started off as a, as a humble child in, went to, <laughs> in Wisconsin. <laughs> he went to a place called Northland College, is that correct? Where he studied psychology. Um, he did his PhD at Duke University with um, Irv Diamond, and then did a postdoc with a tremendously, a tremendously famous uh, comparative neuroscientist, Clint Woolsey, at University of Wisconsin. Uh, John, okay, so I, t I had the speaker send me their c CVs. John's is ridiculous, it's 77 pages. <laughs> and I hate to do numbers, but I'm like, okay, how many, I'll, I'll just tell, say how many publications. He's got 332 publications, like journals, and I thought that included chapters. Then there was a section on chapters. And I'm scrolling down, it's like, okay, maybe he's gotta have 70. I'm like, I reach 100 and 150, then it was 192. So our speculation was that you must have plagiarized a number of your own chapters. <laughs> How could you have 192 chapters? John um, has been a member of, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, which is the most prestigious group of scientists in the country, I think, in, was it 2000? Um, he is a distinguished uh, professor at Vanderbilt University. He has made tremendous uh, contribution to our understanding of mammalian brain evolution, um, neocortical plasticity, um, in adult plasticity, and, and human brain evolution. And I think I've said, as I can, say, I can go on and on. I did my PhD with John, and he has, so in, in addition to his own um, am amazing science, he has also produced, oh, now this sounds terrible, a number of really good scientists. <laughs> I'm not talking about me. He's got a tremendous scientific legacy, and it's a real pleasure to have him here today, where he's gonna talk about evolution of the human brain. Okay, come on. And look, this is fine. Okay? And this is, goes that way. Okay. Thank you. Now, feel free to ask questions at any time, and we'll see how this goes. But I want to start off by saying that uh, we're all people across the planet have been interested all along on how they got here, where they came from what that meant. And most cultures uh, came up with stories, creation stories, of how we got here. And they're all very interesting, and they're fun, and they're different. And this is the one that most of us are used to, and, and it ended up badly. We didn't <laughs> only a short time in paradise. But here's a quite different story, and it comes from Central America, the Aztecs. And I won't go into this, but it's very interesting of how we got here. It depended a lot on that head spitting into that woman's hand, and she got pregnant. So that was a new way of it happening. Uh, but we do have another explanation. The other explanation is, is that we came from a long line of ancestors, and Richard Dawkins in the ancestor tale uh, gave us some idea of, of how to imagine how this happened, and that is to imagine uh, what your grandmother or grandfather looked like, and then what their grandfather and grandmother looked like, and going back in time further and further and further, and then you end up with uh, individuals that don't quite look like uh, we look like. Our grandparents look quite a bit like us, and our great parents looked a lot like us, but then less and less and less like, like ourselves. And if we go back uh, uh, three and a half million years, you'll end up with something like this, the famous uh, fossil Lucy, who was reconstructed, and I took this picture, in a, in a museum. And uh, she looks rather pensive here, thinking about things, and you don't really know what she thinks. But we could go back ever more in time. And what I want to do is go back to the uh, line that led to, we won't go back past early amniotes, which would be early reptiles in my mind. But if we just think about uh, recent times, and recent times would be over the last two million years, that's when the most astonishing things happen in human or hominid evolution. And that's because the brain increased so much in size over a two per million, million year period. And increase in size must have been important because it gives us many more neurons, 
much more computational ability and so on. So this is something very important that happened rapidly over uh, two million years. So we had about a threefold increase in brain size in that time. And we increased roughly from the size of a chimpanzee brain uh, three or four times to the size of a human brain. And, uh, and we could now think, well, we had sort of chimp-like behavior before we got this increase in size. And uh, now, we, from the fossil record, we know the volumes of, from the endocranial cast and so on, the volumes of our ancestors over this long period of time, or supposed ancestors. And because we now know scaling rules, rules for primate brains and how primate brain, brains with increases in size gain neurons. This came largely from the work of Suzanne Herculando Huzel, who uh, developed this whole area of using an isotropic fractionator method of counting neurons and non-neurons in brains. But we could see that we increased not only in brain size, but in billions of neurons from starting off uh, with this uh, chimp-sized brain with 35 billion neurons and rapidly increased to present-day humans with around 88 billion neurons in about 100, 1,400 gram uh, weight of the brain. These are estimates of what these individuals might have looked at like, and we, we know that they can't be too accurate because now we're just starting to figure out the dinosaurs had feathers. And all of our pictures in our dinosaur books don't have feathers. Uh, but uh, what else do we have to do? We have to think about what else changed besides the brain size, and was that important or not? And we already talked, we had talked about cortical areas, and cortical areas in Brodmann's terms from uh, 100 or more years ago was that they were the organs of the brain. So it's like, uh, this is the heart, this is the liver, this is the stomach, this is the pancreas, and so on. There are parts of the brain in the cortex that are specialized for certain kinds of functions, and if subcortically, we'd call them uh, nuclei. And so the question is, uh, how many areas are there, and did that change over the period of evolution, and so on. And then it also raises the issue of how do you define an area and are there other terms? And we talked about modules earlier and so on. I'm going to talk about it, an in-between term. I'll talk about modules a little bit, but mainly areas. But also, if it gets a little confusing, I might just use the term domain. But here's an estimate from 1991 from Fellman and Van Essen. Dan Fellman was a, a graduate student with me, and he went and did a postdoc with David Van Essen. And they, a convenient way, as Leah has already shown you, of showing like, how areas are arranged on, on the surface of cortex. And this whole talk is going to emphasize cortex because that's about 80% of the human brain. If you flatten this out, you can see how the areas, because the cortex is a sheet of a couple millimeters or so thick, and it's a, a big sheet. And you can see the areas if you flatten it out, but of course it's folded up to fit in the head. So this is Fellman's and Van Nessen's idea of what a macaque monkey brain, one-tenth the size or so of a, of a human brain, would be like in dividing it up into areas in 1991. And, and all the colored ones are areas that are predominantly, in their view, visual in function, although a number of them are multimodal, multisensory. And then you have somatosensory areas, motor areas, cingulate areas, prefrontal areas, and, and uh, areas that are related, like the hippocampus and endorhinal cortex, uh, to memory functions. And it's always been a little surprising to me because we think our brains are so special, but look how big the eyes and the retina are compared to the brain. And this is always sort of shocking when you think, because uh, one of the primates, for example, uh, Tarsier, has a much bigger brain, much bigger eye. Each eye is much bigger than its brain. So this is a starting point in, in saying, well, there's a lot of areas. How many areas? There were, and, and, and where do we go from there? Whoop, did I do something? Uh, ah, <laughs> we went there. I know, I Hold pressed on. the wrong button. Yeah, that you did. Hold on. But, but John, while Liz is starting, yeah. if you look at all these areas that are dedicated to vision, in terms of neural numbers, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But it's not that yeah. they all have, let's say, the same relative. Good point. Right? Good point. Good point. And I would say that uh, Leah was saying how large her visual cortex is, primary visual cortex, but it's the same size as the chimpanzees. <laughs> sort of humiliating to think that. <laughs> but the point here is, is that it's the same for all of us. So as the brain got three times bigger from chimpanzees to humans, primary visual cortex didn't get bigger. So there's, a, there's an end to thinking bigger is better, at least for some cortical areas. And I'll come back to that point. But this is the wiring diagram. This is, and it's way more complicated than this. So this is why you sort of give up trying to make a wiring diagrams. But this is their wiring diagram of the visual system. And you think, oh my goodness. But it le and these are hypothetical wiring diagrams. It's based on data, but probably goes beyond the data. And I would say the number of cortical areas and the identity of the cortical areas is greatly in, in question. Out of their 35 visual areas that they talked about, they ranked them uh, one to three in terms of whether they were well-founded or poorly founded. And they only had five that they gave a one to. And I disagreed on two. <laughs> that left three. Uh, we're, we're in a little better situation now, but what they really did, and what the advance was, is that they gave an approximation of the complexity of the visual system. Approximation that is roughly right. Everybody would agree. Roughly it's going to be in the order of 30 or 40 visual areas for a macaque monkey. And here's one I did with a uh, uh, graduate student and postdoc with me, Troy Hackett. And this is just the auditory system. You can do that for auditory processing as well. And you can do it for other areas and so on. But what I'd like to bring, because Henry Kennedy will be here later this week. And uh, in two, just a few years ago, this is his view of uh, macaque monkey, the same one that I showed you before. And, and that one had roughly 57 or 58 areas altogether. That was Fellman and Van Essence. Kennedy is up the ante to 117. And the more recent one, which I'll get to at the end of the talk, is from David Van Essen. It's 145 or something, 48. So we really don't know. <laughs> That's the question. But the estimates keep going up. Now that adds a lot of complexity when you think of what, a, if you want to figure out and model a whole brain at once, you can think of the complexity in terms of connections. I'm just, if you just talk about cortical connections, but you talk about cortical and subcortical connections, everything. You think of the huge complexity of what we're trying to figure out and how it works and what it does. But I want to point out that it was easier when I was going to uh, graduate school. I hate to go back this far, but uh, this is the leading textbook in, in, in well, this is from the Triune Bain. The book came out by McLean in 1967. And he divided up the brain into three main parts. And if anybody is familiar with Freud, and maybe a lot of people aren't anymore because Freud is dead. Uh, what? What? <laughs> but Freud had the ego, the superego, they had three main parts. And this is modeled after the same thing. The reptilian brain would be the head. The ego would be this uh, limbic system, paleo-mammalian brain. And then the superego, which prevents you from doing all the things the other two parts want you to do. Uh, is up there on the top and most developed in humans, unfortunately. <laughs> that was the view then. And here's the textbook picture that, that came about at about the same time. And the textbook picture was based on the, on the studies that were being done at the time where you could put electrodes on animals that were anesthetized or humans, if, you were, if they were in surgery, and, and get responses to stimuli. But it turned out the anesthetics that used at the time knocked out everything except the primary areas. So all people knew about were the primary sensory and motor areas, electrically stimulating, giving you motor movement, and so on. So most of the rat, if you remember Leo's rat picture, didn't look quite like that, but something like that. Most of the rat's brains responded to something. Cat, sort of in between. This is the pseudophylogenetic scale. Everybody would faint now if they used that sort of scale. Rat, cat, monkey, human. But the real point was is that the mystery meat goes into the sausage making, made up most of the cortex. You didn't know, have a clue of what it did. 
And so that was called association cortex. It is, must be associating what the other stuff does. <laughs> so it was pretty easy to know how brains evolved at that time. <laughs> And, but there are other ways of getting at this, and one way would be to look at the fossil record. Now we know from the fossil record you don't get much. You get the shape of the brain, if you're lucky, the size of the brain, if you're lucky from the fossil record. You can look back into the past and get some hints about function and, and make some uh, guesses at this time. This is from Natural History Museum in Paris. It's a wonderful place to go. You can see all the skeletons all around. You can look in drawers and find things. It's a great adventure. But the other way is to do comparative studies. And you'll hear from Zoltan Molnar a lot about comparative studies of dorsal cortex in reptiles, wolves in birds, and neocortex in mammals, because uh, those are considered homologous parts that, by Owen's definition, the same part in different lines of, of uh, he wouldn't use the word evolution of creation. <laughs> and so the, we can look at a turtle cortex, and it has a little bit of dorsal cortex here, and it's homologous to the huge amount of neocortex we have. And then the medial cortex now there is homologous to the hippocampus and the lateral to olfactory cortex. So here you have lateral cortex that's olfactory, this little bit of dorsal cortex which becomes neocortex, and this medial cortex which becomes curled up in nice hippocampus. All of it looks pretty much the same at this in, in, a, in a reptile. And that is, is that you have a single roll of pyramidal cells that do all the work, so most of the work anyway, and you have inputs that come in from the thalamus, and, it can, and each input connects widely to large numbers of pyramidal cells, the apical dendrites of pyramidal cells. And you have a few other neurons that are mainly inhibitory mixed in here, and they're modulating this a little bit and changing a little bit. But these neurons sum vast amounts of inputs and then send an output back to the brain stem, to the thalamus and the brain stem. And another, they sent a branched out input to the hippocampus, or what will become the hippocampus. And so basically, let's try to remember some of these things and let's send a message out. But this is summing. It's a great summing machine, but it's not very good in preserving information, because if you sum, you lose information. That's our, now we don't know if the immediate ancestors of mammals had a cortex like this or not, because this, the, the amniotes divided into two big branches a very long time ago, over 300 million years ago. And so one branch went off in one direction and became all the existing reptiles and uh, birds. And the other branch gave rise to all kinds of branches as well, and they all died out except mammals. So we've got mammals to look at. We don't know, and all mammals have a different kind of cortex, so we don't know what their immediate ancestors were like. But we do think that if you go back very far in time, you're going to get something like this. So something like this had to change to something like this if we're emphasizing cortex. And cortex, neocortex is an amazing structure, I think, because it has this thick array of neurons from the surface to the white matter. And traditionally, it's divided up into six layers, all the different investigators, Cajal did different number and so on, because you can divide it up on different criteria in a different way. But now it's sort of traditional to say, let's do six. And what's, what, uh, What's really different is that you still have these things that come up to layer one and travel long distances and activate a lot of different cells, uh, but they come breaking right through this whole mess instead of coming up from the side and going across. Uh, but the big change was actually that you have inputs that come in and they don't go on, they don't activate very many neurons. They activate only a few neurons in a very specific sort of region. And this allows information to be preserved. And this is what you would happen in primary visual cortex. You want to preserve every bit of visual, every visual bit, so you have a visual scene still preserved. And these neurons will activate in a column, a vertical column that will analyze and change this input so the output is somewhat different. 
And that's the whole thing that happens in a column in cortex. And that input depends on the intrinsic neurons, but it also depends on connections that are lateral in here. And then uh, you can send this information back to uh, its source or back to another area of cortex. Here would be back to the source in this layer, and this layer would be subcortically. So you were dividing up the processed information and sending it to different locations for different tasks. So this is much different than what we saw in a reptile uh, dorsal cortex. And I would hold that this gives you computational abilities that, that just were brand new and so powerful that mammals became evolved to use this cortex in, in so many different ways. Uh, some of the ways, some, some mammals, and, and Leah showed you some of them, uh, decided uh, we don't need a big brain because we're going to reproduce very rapidly. Because the cost of making a big brain is that you have a hard time maturing. It takes a long time. You have a low reproductive rate. Except for humans, they've solved that problem. <laughs> but, but, or you can say, OK, most of us are going to die real early. But we got a whole bunch of us, and we can create a mouse every few weeks. Another batch, another batch, another batch. But everything eats mice. You know, they're in danger all the time. If, if a mouse ever got to two years, it would be you know, unheard of, unless it's in the laboratory. It might totter around in, the room, in there for two years. So you, have two, so you have one strategy. Let's just reproduce a lot. Then you have another strategy. Let's specialize in some way. We're going to echolocate, or we're going to have an electrical resective no nose or something. You don't, have a, you don't need a big brain. If you specialize, then you can fill in, or you can say, I want to have a computational capacity. I want to adjust to the environment. Predators have to get smarter to get the prey, and, and, and prey has to get smarter to get away. And you have a sort of arms race going on. Those are the sort of factors that influence the way that brains can evolve. But the plasticity, the variability that cortex gives is an important point. You can go in so many different directions. And we're going to just talk about one direction, and that's towards a human brain. So, John, if you had to speculate on the kind of environmental pressure mm -hmm. that would help fitness to be served by these changes to cortical mm -hmm. design, what would it be? So, there are so many different ways that you can enhance your reproductive ability or your ability to survive. And so, a special sense I would be one. Uh, Reproduce rapidly and don't worry about it would be another. I, I remember a mouse getting into the kitchen and I, it was hiding under something. I lifted up the, cu lift up the piece of paper, it was hiding under and it ran straight to my cat and it was dead in a second. <laughs> it has a visual cortex, but it doesn't do it much good. <laughs> well, it might have been infected, but, it might have been infected with this, this yeah. parasite, right? Yeah. Less that, yeah. 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 Cat. yeah. <laughs> More delicious too, I hope. <laughs> yeah. So I can we can talk about all the different directions, but I'll and we and I should think especially about what would lead to going towards the human brain. But this is just an injection in a tissue slice of, of a tracer in the middle layers of cortex, and you can see, you know, how beautiful this uh, uh, dorsal ventral connections are that bring this whole column together. But then there's a tremendous output, and there are lateral connections and so on. And this, this is where you get this sort of picture wherever you inject the cortex. Now, this gives you some w things you can do with, uh, with, with the information that's coming in from the thalamus, say to primary visual cortex or to somatosensory cortex. You, you can, if you have many areas, you can repeat the calculation process. So this is sort of like a computer analogy that, P that Pinker did. Steve Pinker in his book on how the mind works is, is that the calculations that go on within a single column in cortex, if you repeat them over and over again, you end up with a very complicated out outcomes. Simple steps can lead to complicated outcomes, and that's basically how a computer does all the complicated things it does, through a series of simple steps. You can also divide the information so that you're going and creating new channels. So Area one doesn't have to put out just one kind of information. It can put out several and put them in different channels. And then that can go on and on and on. But you can also converge things and bring things back together. 
to do higher order executive functions, as they say in the frontal lobe, for example. So this is why cortex is important. Now, I want to focus on evolution from early mammals to primates and not look at all the branches because there are so many branches all over the place that we could look at. But we have to go back to uh, our ancestors. We already talked about mammal-like reptiles, what, what they've been like, but early mammals. What were early mammals like? Then what would be uh, the ancestors? So we think of, uh, of eucontiglers up here. That's the branch that leads to primates up here. So we go here and we see our, our uh, relatives uh, and uh, we have just a few animals in here and I'll come back to those. But the fossil record indicates until recently, about 65 million years ago from 250, that most mammals remain small uh, maybe the, uh, mouse size, maybe rat size, sometimes cat size, but small. They were not only small, but their skulls were small and their brains were small. And here's an example of 85 million year olds from uh, uh, an investigator who did a lot of these early investigations, has a tremendous uh, book on the brains of early mammals from the uh, endocats, but you can't learn very much from the endocast because you can just, if you're really lucky, you get a good endocast and you can see the olfactory bulbs here. This is the piriform cortex or olfactory cortex. You see olfactory bulb and piriform cortex made up a lot of the forebrain. And this is just a little tiny cap of neocortex that they could tell by a little tiny groove that you could r rarely see, but sometimes see right here, which would indicate the separation from piriform to neocortex. And then the midbrain was uncovered. The neocortex wasn't expanded and covering up the midbrain like it would be in a human brain or a primate brain. So you can look down and see some features of, this, of the midbrain and also uh, something about the cerebellum. But that was about it, what you could get. But that was a good guide to what to look for. And the idea that we had a long time ago was if you want to think about what were the, what, how were the brains organized of the early mammals, the best thing to do would be to look at present day mammals in the different branches across all six major branches if possible that I showed you earlier and see what they had in common. And the cladistic approach to looking at brain evolution or any kind of morphological evolution is, is uh, say, uh, look at the, the relationships of different animals and see what they share in common. And if, if two close relatives have something in common, it's likely that their ancestor did. If it's not in common, if it's different, then you're, then you're sort of out on, in the dark and you don't know what came first. So what would all these mammals across the six branches share? And that would give us an early mammal brain. But it would be foolish to start looking at a human brain or an elephant brain because you know they're huge, they don't resemble early mammal brains at all, and you, you, don't, you wouldn't know what to look at. So let's look at branches of the mammalian revolution, uh, evolution that where some of these mammals have retained or still have small brains, or maybe their ancestors had larger brains and they got smaller, but let's look at what small brains have in common. And this is one of the animals that we were lucky enough to look at. And, and Leah was the lead author on this study. And this is a tenrec from Madagascar. And fortunately, there's some great animals in Madagascar that are preserved by it being an island and isolated from a competition. And these tenrecs would be one of them. They had a number of species, but if you uh, look at their brain, and this is the flattened view of, of the forebrain, the, I like to call it the roadkill preparation. And, you, and what this is amazing because the whole brain is flat. And I'll show you a, 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 a view of the intact brain. But the olfactory bulb is huge. Piriform cortex is huge. This is the olfactory tubercle. It's huge. All this will be olfactory, just a huge amount. And this is neocortex here. Visual, auditory, somatosensory. I'll come back to that. This is uh, retrosplenial cortex and cingulate cortex here and then the corpus callosum and things in here. And here's the hippocampus folded out. So you can see the hippocampus is actually bigger by, than, than all of neocortex in this particular animal. 
And if you look on cortex, this is where these things fall out. This is what it looks like, big cerebellum. Midbrain is sticking right out there. Nothing, no cortex covering it, mainly piriform cortex. So we know olfaction was the most important thing to this animal, is the most important because they still exist. But we can look at others. And this is sort of interesting because Leah showed uh, the uh, uh, South American opossum. And North and South America, we call them opossums. But if you go to Australia, they're called possums. They look just like this, or like the one Leah showed you. And they're, because a continental drift, and they got to Australia and others state and got to America, they were all tied together at one time. They're apart. They couldn't have interbred for 100 million years. So they're isolated from one another 100 million years. So if you look at their cortical organization, they're separated by 100 year, million years. It's practically the same. So it says time stood still for these guys in terms of their adaptation to their environmental niche uh, in Australia or in South America or North America. This is on my back porch. They're cute, aren't they? But they're dirty. And if you flatten out the brain, and this use experimental methods and so on to identify these structures. But it's, it's amazing how much you can see in flattened cortex. Because this, this is parvobumin, for example. This is myelin. Everybody likes myelin. But you can see that there's a visual cortex here. You know, you go in an electrode. This is primary visual cortex by connections, by uh, the map that you get by the neuron responses and so on, somatosensory cortex and so on. So you see these areas. Primary visual cortex, auditory cortex, somatosensory cortex, and there's frontal cortex. We don't know what that does. But you see the similarity to the map that v Leah showed you. So you, you can say these brains were organized in a similar manner, and they stayed in those two branches of marsupial evolution in these, not in kangaroos and so on. They changed and, uh, they, for 100 million years. And it looks more or less like this when you put it together, and I won't go into it, except I want to point out that we believe, and it's a little bit controversial, that until you got to placental mammals, you didn't get any motor cortex, any separate motor cortex. This somatosensory cortex had motor functions, and it still does, and most mammals have motor functions. But there wasn't a separate motor area. And it's, if you make a lesion, of motor cortex, or sens sensory cortex here, which has the motor functions. Uh, it, all the motor functions aren't really dependent on cortex. You take that cortex away, and the animal wakes up from anesthesia, and it walks away, like nothing happened. Something happened, but it's not easy to see from their immediate behavior. And this goes back, because you showed a hedgehog. And Hedgehog would be a European or Eurasian hedgehog, which is an insectivore with uh, very little brain, according to early stories. And uh, this is a study I did in 1970. So just have to say, it takes a long time to figure things out. <laughs> Here's a section through this cortex. Here's a mark that shows the edge, physiological edge of primary visual cortex. This is a marker that shows the margin of binocular with the two eyes, primary visual cortex. And this is the monocular segment. It goes down to there, down to here. So this is it. You can even in this hedgehog see that visual cortex looks a little different than the other cortex, but not very much. So one of the points I want to make here is that the differentiation of cortical areas structurally wasn't very great in early mammals. And then you go out here. here and this thick layer one is, of course, the most important layer in a reptile. That's, that's where the, all the inputs are coming in. So you can see layer one is still pretty thick relative to the rest, so it's still important. And then layer two up here is also important. That's also considered uh, a primitive feature of cortical organization. So if we compare across the whole range of mammals of little brain, we can come up with this sort of composite. And this sort of composite is before placental mammals. That's why I haven't added in a motor cortex yet. But there are a lot of placental mammals that don't have much more than this. They just add motor cortex would be the biggest change. And so you have all these areas 
and we think these areas were there in very early mammals and they were there in, we would say, in almost every mammal that you would find. Maybe a clave, you know, some mammals will have very little primary visual cortex because they're virtually blind or are blind as far as cortex is concerned uh, because they don't have enough neurons even if they have visual input to really have an image anymore. Uh, but about something around between 15 and 20 areas would characterize early mammals. So now we have the aerial uh, organization wasn't that complicated and the laminar organization wasn't that complicated, but they had those features that I showed you before of different input and output layers. And from there, you could go in almost any direction. But I want to show you some subcortical things and show you what generally can happen. What generally can happen is you differentiate structures you already have. You sp start to specialize them in some way. So here's the midbrain. This is from a hedgehog. You see a clump of cells without any clear lamination. That, that would be the ancestral sort of midbrain for mammals. And here would be a highly visual animal, a squirrel. And you see different sizes of cells in there and some layers and a big structure. And here's the same thing in another animal, not closely related, but close, uh, with a different kind of organization but, and specialization in the laminar way. So you can go from there to there, or you can go from there to there. Or you can go from here is the lateral geniculate nucleus, which again looks sort of homogeneous, visual structure, not much structure to it. And you can go to a squirrel and get laminated lateral geniculate, which has happened over and over in mammals. And that's separating cells by different functional types, structurally, isolating them from one another. Or you can get this kind of structure, different laminar structure, and with a different arrangement of functions. And over here is a visual structure called the pulvinar. I won't talk about this, but you can see how poorly this is organized here. Nicely differentiated here, nicely differentiated in a similar way. So you can have things that look somewhat similar across different lines that came about independently. And uh, one of the graduate students that worked with me is now a postdoc with uh, Leah Krubitzer has worked on the pulmonar evolution, and I won't have time to go into this, but by looking in a comparative way across a lot of mammals and looking at specific stains, connection patterns, and so on, we constructed a theory, a story, if you like, of how the pulmonar complex evolved in primates. And it was once thought that only primates had the pulmonar, and everybody was very nervous because when they found something like a pulmonar in a rat or a, a squirrel or, or somewhere else, cats, uh, they said we have to name it something not like the pulmonar. So that's where the term lateral posterior came in. They started calling it lateral posterior, lateral posterior complex, and then some people said, well, part of it must be pulmonar, and then you and cats, you have lateral posterior and pulmonar, but it's all pulmonar. And we're trying to get at a theory of how the complex primate pulmonar uh, uh, came about. And the part in yellow there is special because it goes to temporal cortex, and it goes to temporal cortex and brings information that's visual to temporal cortex in all mammals. And it's independent of the geniculate pathway, which goes to primary visual cortex. So you have some vision possible without primary visual cortex. And this probably is what's mediating what they call in humans with the primary visual cortex damage, blind sight. It's not conscious vision, at least usually, but they can make judgments about visual stimuli nonetheless. If you take out in a tree shoe, for example, primary visual cortex, or in a cat, primary visual cortex, take it out, the tree shoe can still catch food. You know, it, it'll catch a, a, a grasshopper in midair. Uh, because its vision is so good using temporal cortex in the second pathway. What? Yeah, yeah. It's, you have to do careful testing to see what they can't do. And what they can't do is they have a hard time uh, fractionating complex stimuli. They'll put everything together 
this moving together or whatever or stationary. So if you want to do, they can tell a triangle from a square, but if you put a circle around it, then they're, they're done. The circle dominates the whole thing. It just becomes one thing then for them. I th these are some of the things I just went over and I, and I won't repeat them because time is important here. But I want to go on and now look at advances from the early kind of brain with only a few cortical areas and, and go on and talk about one branch over here, uh, Eukonta glares, which glares would include uh, rabbits and rodents, the two main branches of that, rabbits and rodents, or lagomorphs and rodents. And, and then you have another branch would be uh, flying lemurs, which aren't, don't fly, they glide and they're not lemurs, uh, but that's a common name. And then we have primates, tree shoes, and then primates. So the close relatives of primates would be tree shoes, which LeGros Clark thought were primates because they had such a good visual system, uh, but it's clearly a separate branch, and the flying lemurs. And we can't really study flying lemurs. They're, they're endangered and we can't get them, but tree shoes can be bred in the laboratory and we know a lot about their brains as a result. We can compare that to primates. Here's a tree shoe, and, and you can see why uh, immediately some people say that's not a primate. You know, it doesn't look very much like a primate. Uh, but it has big eyes and a well developed visual system, and that's what fooled LeGros Clark. But they're close relatives, so they might share some things with primates. And I don't have time to really go into all the possibilities, but we know quite a bit about brain organization. Uh, but we don't know how this large amount of visual cortex is organized. We have some hypotheses about how it's organized. We know there's a somatosensory area here, and we know ahead of it there's a motor cortex, and then there's a premotor area up here that's not shown, and a second visual area. Everyone would agree on these sort of things, and down here, auditory cortex. Uh, but there's an interesting thing about primary visual cortex, because there's a kind of organization in primary visual cortex that every primate has, but no rodent has. So, and tree shoes share this with primates. So it could have evolved in the ancestors of tree shoes, the common ancestors of tree shoes and primates. And this is primary visual cortex and you're looking down at the top. And what happens is that rodents, lagomorphs, most animals will have in primary visual cortex neurons that are sensitive to stimulus orientation. That's one of the computations that happens in cortex is that you uh, get neurons that are sensitive to selective for a stimulus of a certain orientation. It could be a line of any kind of orientation in the receptive field, but it responds very well to some orientation and poorly as you move away from that. Now you can show that these neurons are grouped together by optically imaging cortex while you're rotating a, a visual stimulus or a complex one. So you have the orientation continuously changing. And when you do this, and this is from David Pen Fitzpatrick's lab, uh, when, when you do, when you, when you uh, do that, uh, the red would be this particular orientation, the blue would be another orientation, and so on. So you're just coloring code the activity as it changes in location. So this kind of organization wouldn't occur in most mammals. It would be just a blur of, of all the colors together because individual neurons would prefer an orientation, but they wouldn't be grouped together like this. Grouping together probably gives some computational advantage in, in connections. And the point of the black up here is to show that the connections are selective the lateral connections in cortex are selective for modules or columns of the same functional type, the same kind of preferences that are interconnected with another. And you might think that would be useful to see how long a line continues or an edge continues in the same direction, for example. But tree shoes share that with primates, and that's my only point. They have some features that they share with primates that we don't share with rodents. And then we have other features that we share with rodents and so on. So this is how, using a cladistic approach, we try to get an idea of when and what came in place uh, in human evolution. But it's still dicey in that they could have evolved this independently, and primates could have evolved it independently. 
and I won't go into this, but the motor cortex up there, and you can see there's a lot of posterior re visual regions and other regions that are providing input to motor cortex. Uh, and here's some similarities and, and differences that tree shoes would share, but I want to jump now to early primates. And this is a depiction from skeletal remains of an early primate, not that early, you know, in the sense that it's right after the, the big extinction uh, of uh, 60, uh, 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 9 million years ago when the asteroid went into the Gulf of Mexico and most life disappeared. But primates didn't, they remained, and, and the early primates lived in the fine branches of trees, judging from their skeletal remains. And that meant they were good at grasping. They could feed in, and get, find fruit and insects in these, in these fine branches. And they also would be protected largely from a lot of predators that couldn't get into the fine branches. So you could escape from predators by going out to finer branches they could, than they go. Or if it's a flying hawk or eagle, you could escape by going into the fine branches where the birds could, or prey couldn't go. So it was, and, and you could be nocturnal and, and avoid a lot of things. And early primates were thought to be nocturnal. But the emphasis in this picture is, is that you could hold on to if you're a good grasper, you could hold on to a fine branch and reach out and get an insect or a piece of fruit or something. And so now there would be selection for ability to develop neural systems for using eye-hand coordination to reach out for things instead of grabbing with your face or your mouth. Uh, and this also uh, meant that they had frontal eyes. Frontal eyes would be specialized for stereoscopic vision, getting the two images and seeing what the disparity would lead to giving a third dimension. But, it, but to really use your two eyes efficiently, you want a short snout so you're not interfering with your visual uh, scene. And that puts your eyes at risk when you're grabbing things with your face, when your snout is short. So it's better to grab things with your hand and if something bad happens, you let it go. But if you got it, put it in your mouth then. So uh, the approximation to early primates would be to look at prosimian primates. The prosimian primates are varied, and, and some of them are quite advanced, so you don't want to take the real advanced ones. But we have a nice collection of, of lemurs on Madagascar, saved from an extinction by being isolated there. You have Southeast Asia, you have the lorises. And, and the pados, the slender loris, and the slow loris. Uh, and in Africa, you have the galagos. And they persist in competition with monkeys by being nocturnal. There are no nocturnal monkeys there, so they're completely on their own there. And uh, they have retained a lot of skeletal tissues that look like early, early primates. So they have some features that are much like early primates. And the, and the brain is very much like early primates in shape, except for one thing, and that is that the temporal lobe is more expanded than it would be in early primates. So the temporal lobe is visual, so they've already moved away from early primates and become much more visual than the early primates were. But this goes along with the hand-eye coordination, the living in trees and so on. And if we, we know a lot about these animals from years and years of work on their brain organization. And this is a complex picture, but I just flattened cortex. And, I, and the, the, the dots and bands here are just to do, show that there's a modular kind of organization that characterizes all primates in these primates. So we know that it evolved early in primates because all branches of primates have these. Everything else I'm showing here is characteristic of all primates, all branches of primates. So that it evolved with the early primates and has been retained in all the branches. That, but you can see an arrangement of areas un, without a lot of new stuff added in here yet. And so you can see the somatosensory areas over here, the motor areas, a complex, it's amazing how that we have all this complex of motor and premotor areas already, including frontal eye fields. And all these familiar to those that are working on envision in primates, uh, visual areas back here and a co complex over here and a complex for auditory processing over here. And then posterior parietal cortex, which is, has some modules in, and I want to talk about these, 
we call them domains because the, if you have a region like primary motor cortex, and then you have functionally specialized regions within that, then you say, well, primary motor cortex is an area, then what are the specializations within? And we're used to saying that areas often have a sort of a repeating organization of certain kind of, of columns or, or modules that use. This module does this and is repeated 100 times in V2 or V1 or something like that. And we have another module that does something else and it's repeated 100 times and so on. But what if the module is only repeated once? It's only one of them and it's part of an area or a larger region Then what you call them. And we, we, we just for our own benefit, uh, refer to them as domains. And I'll come back and talk about these domains. But I just want to show you that we can identify cortical areas in these primates by a number of different ways. And you, connection patterns would be one. Uh, physiology with microelectrode recordings would be another that would be very good. But also we can do this by histology. And if you flatten cortex, you can see a whole area in one section. It's a favorable section through the depths of cortex and it's stained in this case for, for cytochrome oxidase, which cytochrome oxidase is an e enzyme that neurons have because it, it's an enzyme for using, um, having a high metabolic rate. So being able to handle a high metabolic rate, you would have a lot of cytochrome oxidase. So this means these are areas that are more active than surrounding. So there's a functional connection. One is the middle temporal area right here. Another one is the middle uh, 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 superior temporal region. And then there's another area that I, we call MTC for crescent. So you can see little pulp-like modules if you really have a keen eye that go around here. And, and so we can identify these, many of these areas architectonically, but others are based on other kinds of evidence if it's not a clear architectonic uh, or structural uh, difference. And here's the way of, of identifying areas by connections. And so you've heard, probably everybody has heard that usually you think about visual areas. There's a primary one called V1, a secondary one called V2, and a lot of people believe in or have heard of at least a third visual area, V3. And then it gets confusing because some people like to use V5, V8, V10, or something like that, or just use other names like MT, DM, and so on. But the point I want to make here is, is that if you, you can get the connection patterns and see them in a flattened cortex and start to think, this tells us something about how the brain is organized. So inject a tracer right here. This was done by David Lyon, who's now just got tenure at, so he's coming along. And, uh, herb, uh, and he injected here, and then they processed the brain. And the neurons here are transporting whatever was injected. This is uh, pr probably a cyto cytochrome oxidase, I mean, a color toxin fragment B. And this is where one set of terminate, they terminate here, they also terminate here. So you'd say, must be in two areas here. If you inject up here, you get here and you get over here. So it must be two areas up here. So that's how you can get evidence besides electrophysiological evidence and other kinds uh, by the connection pattern. But what you can't see very easily because most of the connections go here and here. But there's a small amount you can just barely see over here in MT. And there's another small amount that you can't probably see over here in DM. So those would be the, the main targets the four main targets of, of V1. Now, when Henry Kennedy, if he talks about this in comes, he'll say V1 actually has about 17 areas or something like that it connects to. So if you get down to the real small a fraction of 1%, then you're going to get in a lot. But these are the main ones. And they help us define how cortex is organized, the connection patterns do. Yeah. Just thinking about it, this is really cool, what Henry said about the hmm. um, is, is the critical variable that you have a connection at all, or the quantity of the connection? It seems, it seems to me that this is a both critical. Yeah, it's, it's critical. I think a lot of people would argue that a few connections can do a lot. But if, if you're going to, pay, but you can't have much information in a few connections. 
So if you want to transfer a lot of information, you have to have a lot of connections. Now I want to talk about this posterior parietal thing, which this posterior parietal cortex we think is different in early in all primates than in any other mammal. Other animals have a posterior parietal cortex, but it doesn't have this kind of organization or very much something just like this. And this is amazing. And it, and it, and what I'm going to tell you it, that about this posterior parietal cortex. Uh, makes it especially easy to start to think about how to model, how to model exactly what's going on in neural terms because you can have control over it and the control comes from what you can do. He, there's a series of domains in posterior parietal cortex and when you electrically stimulate for a half a second in one of these domains, you'll get a particular behavior, whether the animal's awake or anesthetized, doesn't make any difference. If the animal's awake, they will, the, that behavior will occur every time, no matter what the animal wants to do. It's, it's enslaved, if you like, by, and, 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 and it, I would be too. I've been stimulated transcranially with a, with a magnetic stimulator or, or my motor cortex, and you're just standing there, and then they bang, there's the stimulus, and my thumb would twitch like that. So what, no matter what I wanted to do, the thumb would go. So it's similar to that, and I'll talk about that in terms of motor cortex. But all these different, there's about seven different kinds of behavior that are complex that you can elicit electrically from, from there. And, what the, and the interesting thing about this is we say what, how, what's coming in there and what determines the behavior naturally. And we, we're incomplete in our studies of macaque monkeys yet, but we think that the same organization exists in all primates. And uh, this would be prosimian primate up here. This would be a squirrel monkey. This would be an owl monkey. But the important thing is you have this arrangement that's similar in all of them of these functional domains. And they're matched by functional domains in primary motor cortex and functional domains in premotor cortex. And wherever you stimulate, whether it's in posterior parietal cortex or premotor cortex or motor cortex, you'll get the expected behavior. If it's a reaching behavior, you'll get, you go to the reaching domain and stimulate in any of those three locations and you'll get a reach. Why do you repeat this sort of thing three times? What sense does this make? <coughs> and we're starting to get at this. Some of the studies are done in com with uh, Leah and with cooling experiments where you cool an area and see what happens if you knock one out of the system. We've also used muscimol to knock out areas. And one of the more promising ways is to simulate two domains at once and see what you get. And if you can, now you think, Leva's telling you all the time she spends training animals to get behavior. We don't have to train them. We just electrically stimulate and we get the behavior. Now if you stimulate in another part, what behavior will you get? you're taking all of these variables away. And that's why I think that the opportunity for modeling how the system works exists here and can be addressed much more easily than if you're training animals and letting them make their own decisions. That's just my opinion, but I think it's very promising. Now, if we stimulate two incompatible regions where it's reaching and, and a defensive movement of bringing the hand up to perfect the pace, you stimulate both of those in posterior parietal cortex or in motor cortex and premotor cortex, you, you get uh, neither a movement or a, a struggle trying to get each of those movements out. So we think these different domains have a way of making a decision. The decision for what movement to occur is dependent on the inputs. In posterior parietal cortex, it's dependent on the visual inputs and the somatosensory inputs and a little bit on auditory inputs, which vary in different amounts to these different areas. So they will be in all activated by some input, and then they're in competition with one another, depending on these inputs, and then analysis of the visual input coming in to make a decision of what to do based on visual input or somatosensory input, a combination of them. The one that is activated slightly above any others will inhibit the others. So you cancel out. What's happening at the premotor stage? 
Now you have another way of making decisions. You've already made a decision of what to do on the basis of sensory input, but now you want influences. What if you've now trained the animal, and you can do this, that when uh, a light comes on, don't look at it. You can do this for a person. It, we know that depends on, on prefrontal cortex, the executive functions of prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex's dominant connections in the frontal lobe are with premotor cortex. So we think that the executive functions can change the behavior depending on what you want to do, not what you're sensory driven by sensory stimuli to do, but what you want to do, and you can alter it. If, and motor cortex can deal with all these premotor areas and the input from the thalamus, which would be cerebellar inputs relayed. So you can program exactly what kind of behavior you want to do out of that. You can add the fine frills upon it, and then you're going down subcortical, where subcortical, spinal cord, and other centers, motor centers, have a lot of the programming for the exact nature of the complex behaviors that are coming out. So you have different levels and different decisions made. And I'm just going to argue that by having so much control over what's happening by electrical stimulation and anesthetized animals, uh, we can start to figure out these steps and how they interact. That's my hope. Yeah? So, this is sort of a question. The, so early mammals didn't have anything like this. So no. you're saying like a big thing is primates. Because yeah. it's really um, sophisticated motor control. Yeah. They cut, yeah. Not just on sensory input, but on prefrontal and things as well. So if you took it back to a reptilian stage, you take away the dorsal cortex and turn them loose, you would have a hard time telling any difference. They're, their motor control isn't at this level at all. What about and, a, and, a, and a lot of every mammal's behavior is controlled th through the basal ganglia and, and brainstem centers a lot. Uh, uh, and, and we're getting an idea of how this fits into the picture here from our anatomical studies. But, but uh, we, all mammals will have some cortical control over the behavior, whether they have a motor cortex or not, that'd be through the somatosensory areas. Then you add motor cortex. Already in motor cortex, I think you're getting into decision making based on prefrontal cortex, directly influencing uh, not, not the basal ganglia, not some other place, but, but premotor cortex. And then, and motor cortex. And, and that's what you're gonna see in all placental mammals, that high degree of influence from those areas. But posterior pilot cortex will have an influence as well, but I don't think necessarily it has a decision-making influence. It's, it's a source of complex visual and somatosensory information going to premotor and motor cortex. So you think it's fair to say that, uh, that other non-primate mammals or smaller mammals are more stimulus-bound, whereas humans can make motor behaviors based yeah. on something that happens? Yeah, but we're pretty stimulus-bound as well, I mean, in the sense that if you don't have time to make a complex decision, like somebody throws a ball at your head, you don't think, what should I do? Should I? You know, you do it automatically. Yeah, but, but you can get in your car and drive to an appointment that you made four days ago. Yeah. So yeah. Th that, that's not, that's far away from the... Right yeah, the and, that's, stimulus, right? and, and that's going to depend on stored memories already because working memory don't won't last that long, but it, it, prefrontal cortex will be critical in that. Okay, yeah. So just, I guess, to put a, a point on it, what would maybe an animal like a possum that doesn't have any of these fancy motor areas not be able to do that a placental mammal or even a primate would? Well, so it, at first, you know, it seems like this is being redundant. You, have, you can simulate three different places and you get the same kind of behavior. Uh, you can stimulate somatosensory cortex in the possum and you can evoke behaviors, right? Movement behaviors. So it has a, a role in, in, in those behaviors and, and the sensory control of those behaviors. But uh, it, it would be much more sensory driven in its behavior. Uh, uh, so it, yeah. Another way to look at these are not necessarily segregated areas, right? Because they're also densely interconnected. So it yes. could be that if you go towards more this, this, the, the sensory side of things, that what you're actually doing are driving activity in these more frontal areas and vice yeah. versa, right? Right. So, so it's not necessarily that these are independent. No, they're controls. not independent, but they're independent. They're stages. So you're adding some things in. I, so it's not just repeating. We're doing the same thing again. Because in posterior parietal cortex, 
it's, it's going to be sensory input. There are also feedback projections from premotor cortex and motor cortex, and we think this is widespread sort of inhibition. So the strong input will rise faster, and everything is sort of dampened down by the feedback. So if you actually uh, block out by muscimol or cooling, uh, pre motor cortex, part of motor cortex is one of the domains, you're influencing posterior parietal cortex because you're removing a sense of inhibition that would keep other things from emerging. And so you'll start to see thresholds changing for, for stimulating other places. So it's the interactions are critical, and we think the interactions in the near surround are excitatory, predominantly excitatory. Of course, all the connections are, are excitatory neurons going to either excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons. But in the near surround, you're adding in a fringe of neurons that can be added or, and used to modify the basic behavior. They can add it in or they can be left out. That's the hypothesis. If you go a little further and you're starting into another functional domain, the, the, in, the connections within the region are inhibitory, predominantly inhibitory, and this is winner take all. Everybody's trying to inhibit the other one. Or if they're two highly compatible regions, like yeah, you're going to reach out here or you're going to reach out here, you can reach in between. But if you stimulate a reach domain back here and a reach domain up here, I don't, didn't see where the reach is, but it doesn't matter, uh, it turns out that if you stimulate them both at once in two different regions, posterior parietal cortex and say motor cortex, premotor cortex, the reach is faster and exaggerated, goes further. It's like you've done a stronger stimulation, and you have in that sense. So there are a lot of interactions that we can play out here that can be, uh, you can think of the number of interactions that you could start to investigate. It's huge, but that's what we want to know. What, what happens when, when you stimulate more than one at a time? What, ha what kind of interactions you get? What happens when you take one or the other out of the circuit? And the reason we don't want to use lesions, but use cooling or muscimol, and cooling is better, as Leah knows, because she's developed this whole technique. Uh, plasticity of the brain starts as soon as you do a lesion. You're starting to change the brain organization. They're adapting to it, and you're changing. You can't go back. Uh, we're hoping that if you cool and then go back, and the anim a, a, a week later the animal will be pretty much like it was as if you never cooled it. You can do it again. You can investigate it again. But maybe changes do happen rapidly and stay, even with cooling. Yeah. Do you have a question? Oh, I was saying we. we yeah. I gotta quit. Oh, practically none. Uh, so this is just a hand-to-mouth movement and so on. This is a model of uh, motor cortex because in motor cortex, I just I'll, I should probably stop right here if the time is up. But I'll st st stop with what I'm going to say about motor cortex. If you do just threshold stimulation, which is the usual way of mapping motor cortex, then you have a puzzle, and the puzzle always has been and. and First, it wasn't recognized because early electrode simulations were big and you would never get this detailed information. But if you push a, a microelectrode down to layer four and you simulate motor cortex and get the smallest movement possible, that's how the motor maps are, are obtained. You'll find out you get a digit movement, a wrist movement, a, a shoulder movement, close together. The somatotopy breaks down. Uh, we called it a mosaic kind of organization. Wally Welker, when he went to the uh, somatosensory cerebellum, got the same sort of thing. He called it a fractured somatotopy. Why do you have a fractured somatotopy? Why do you have a fractured motor map at, the, at these threshold levels? And when you stimulate at a high level, you get a defensive point or a grasp or a reach. You get a specific behavior. Because these are components that are shared by these different behaviors. So you have a larger domain that has components of the behavior in. How you read that out by stimulating for a half a second of electrical pulses, it's not clear. But the assumption is, is that you have a circuit of, of stimulation and excitation and so on. If you stimulate and continue to stimulate, the movement gets completed and the animal doesn't do anything anymore. It's frozen. So it's not like the length of 
simulation is uh, continued, that you could continue. In about a half a second, you're over. The movement is over, and it just stays. So there's something about this interaction. And it starts to make sense now that you would have individual body parts represented in, within a domain and repeated in another domain. So uh, I was going to go on and talk about what, you know, size and how brain size matters and so on like this, because this is our fantasy. I'm not going to talk about that now. But I, Dolly, you remember? And why are we so fascinated, especially in Barcelona? I saw these elephants in the window yesterday with the thin legs and so on. We're fascinated by things we know are impossible. We know the elephants can't do that on those little tiny legs. And, and Galileo knew that when he described the bone in the leg of a mouse compared to an elephant. For a bone of a given length, if you scale them up in length, the bone of an elephant is many, many more times thicker because of what it has to do. You can throw up the Tower of Pisa, a mouse lands and runs away, throw an elephant, dies. <laughs> so, so why I was fortunate, I'm, this is my end, I'm just wrapping up now. Uh, I was fortunate in graduate school to have a class by the Nobel Prize, you know, fantastic, not, didn't get the Nobel Prize, his father-in-law did. August Krogh, but Schmidt Nielsen, Knut Schmidt Nielsen at Duke University taught a co course in comparative physiology, and he wrote a book about why size matters, and it's mainly an engineering book because it tells you how many people can you get on an elevator, you know, these kind of things. How do you scale up an elevator so you can have 100 people? What do you do? What problems do you? And the same thing for the body. If you want to get go from small to large, you have to make changes. Or from large to small, you have to make changes. And the whole book on why size matters had not one sentence on the brain. So little was known about the brain. You know, you saw, you saw my picture of association cortex. So little was known about the brain. Nobody had any idea of what it meant to scale according to size. That would be the end part of my talk, and we can talk privately about this, but why size matters. And you can imagine just simple. If you have a visual cortex and you have to have a certain number of, uh, of neurons, say I need 100 neurons to analyze one pixel of visual space. A mouse might have 20 pixels, and we might have 4,000 pixels in our visual cortex. It's better to have 4,000 than 20. That's why the mouse made the mistake and ran for the cat. Poor image. So there's a, a, a reason to have large areas, but the large areas are not good for executive functions. They're not summing. They're not, they're not considering a lot of variables. You're preserving information in the large areas. You're preserving the details of the information. But that information doesn't do you any good unless you sum it somewhere. So people would say if you took out all visual cortex except primary visual cortex blind, you would have visual information you have no use of. So that would be my sort of ending point that we could talk also about scaling. But it's an important point of view from the point of view of engineering. How do you scale things from one size to another? And especially now, when the talk is in the big data picture, as we can scale up information from a mouse brain to a human brain. All we have to do is scale it up some way. But what are the scaling rules? If you don't know the scaling rules, you don't know what you're doing. So. Thank you a lot for staying here and listening. <laughs> Ask me questions anytime. So the tradition at BCBT is to have quite a late lunch. And uh, we said sometime between half past one and two o'clock. So it's now six minutes to two. So if we go at two o'clock, we're OK, yeah, Anna? Anna, okay. we're okay to go for lunch at two o'clock, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so we've we got time for some questions. So uh, let's start with Scott. Even for a non-neuroscientist, I, I appreciated a lot of what you, you said and it gave me a, uh, an interesting perspective being an engineer. Um, the last part, um, you know, why size matters. And so, so obviously the way you've been trying to understand it is by looking at function. Right, the, the reaching um, experiments. Um, 
But has that helped you understand how it is that size matters between a mouse and, and a monkey? C can you use the, c do functional outcomes always sort of explain how it is that the, the, the computation is happening? Well, I think if you have, and I didn't get to this, but if you go to the SMS now of around 150 areas for not counting modules and domains and everything for human brain, and you have maybe 20 in a mouse brain, although some people would argue there are more. But I don't know how you can argue more than when you get down to less than 10, 10 neurons for a function. How, do you, how does that work? Uh, but uh, mouse can't afford to have uh, a lot of detailed information. It can't. It, its vision is going to be just approximate. Its somatosensory maybe is the best shot to have, and that's maybe only for the whiskers and so on. So you have to make your sort of so-called executive functions right away or your, your global functions right away. And that's why they make so many bad decisions. And, and they, they just don't have information to base good decisions on. So they get eaten a lot. That's one way of adapting. If we did that, we'd be gone. Because you, if we fought like a mouse or even a scaled out mouse brain, I would imagine, we would be in big trouble and we would never get the reproductive age. So why it's adding all these computational specializations that add layers and layers and layers on that allow very complex decisions. Not only that, but abilities that would be that's if you ever watch the Olympics, and for me this is the most impression, it's not just that the that the things that everybody can do, it's the things that any individual can do if they or a lot of individuals can do if they spend uh, 20, 50 hours a week practicing, you know, then they, they, I didn't even start to talk about it. But I doubt if a mouse would be changed much by another 20 hours. Maybe Leo would disagree. But, but humans uh, have, a, have large brains that are very susceptible to training, to culture, to all sorts of environmental events that allow them to become specialists, individuals as, as specialists. We have a brain that allows us to specialize individually in so many different ways. And mice, I think, are pretty much mice. Uh, I wanted to invite you to speculate more about humans. Um, and as a starting point, I wanted to give you the observation, I don't remember if you or Leah said it earlier in this morning, that, that V1 is not very different between a chimpanzee and, and a person. Um, so there, there's a lot of scaling up of something else. Um, yeah. w w what are the scaling rules that will get us from so understanding the, so the, a primate the, to the, person? You know, almost the best evidence that we must have more cortical areas in a chimpanzee, and because you really can't do experiments on chimpanzees so, anymore, uh, it, it's going to be hard to ever really come to a resolution on chimpanzees. But if, if they devote as much of their one-third size brain to visual, primary visual cortex as we do, then we must be doing something else. We must be having other areas, other functions added in there. And so the implication of this is, is that we don't need to preserve any more detail in the visual scene than a chimpanzee preserves. And if you ever, the, the visual abilities of a chimpanzee are, are fantastic. I saw in the Leipzig Zoo, they're trained to, go through picture after picture, and they just press a computer, tree or not tree? Is there a tree in this picture? And if the tiniest little tree is somewhere or something, you know, they, they'll, they'll get the picture right in a, in a second. So their ability to analyze a visual scene and come to some conclusion about what's there and what isn't probably is very much like ours. So it'd be interesting to think what things in vision can we do that they don't do but maybe it's not vision. Maybe they're doing things in a sensory domain as well as we are. It's, maybe it's in conceptual. Chimpanzees are vastly different from us conceptually. They don't have abstract, they don't abstract from the sensory abilities. Danny Povanelli has talked several times where we've both been, and, and I'll give you one example. And this is where you train a, a chimpanzee to judge the weight of two balls. And they're all the same in appearance, but they can be heavy or light depending on what you make them out of or put in them. Now, they, 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 they make just as good a discrimination between the weights as, as, as a human. Now you ask them, well, take one of these balls and roll it down this inclined plane and knock something off, and you'll get to eat it. 
they pick either randomly. It'll take them more than a thousand trials, maybe two thousand trials, to ever get the idea that you'd have the, the, the heavy ball will knock it better. That's an abstraction. But you give a two year old child the two, and they don't even need to any experience right away. Which one would you use? They pick this one. They roll the ball down and box it off right away. Why did they pick that way? They don't give an answer. They don't even understand the concept of weight. They say, this is a stronger ball. <laughs> I use a stronger ball. They don't have the vocabulary yet to know why they did something, but they know what to do with it. And that's the big difference between humans and chimpanzees. We have abstractions from the sensory domain. Chimpanzees, we might be very similar in the sensory domain, how we analyze the sensory information, what we do with it. But it's uh, other domains. Hi. Um, do you have any thoughts on why uh, rodents don't have the orientation preference maps topographically organized? You know, th that, you know that's a really uh, good question. And somebody w should start doing visual experiments because a squirrel has a tremendously good visual system and a tree shoot very similar, so you could compare them on visual tasks and see if there are any differences. They can discriminate orientations. That much is known already, so they can do that. But are they doing it more efficiently? Uh, if you have the neurons that are doing a group so they can interact more efficiently with over shorter connections and so on? It, uh, so I, th I think the sizes of V1 are quite similar. The, the size of V1 is quite similar. And the orientation yeah. tuning yeah. in rodents is yeah. very Yeah, so high. it's a, an experiment made by nature, but nobody has done the careful behavior. I think we should probably break for lunch because certainly I need some more food to process all these ideas. Um, so do we have any announcements before lunch? Uh, like, where is lunch? <laughs> 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 so okay, and uh, after lunch, what's happening and where? After lunch, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So l let's finish by just thanking this morning's speakers once again for a great start to BCPT. Thank you. And over lunch, please uh, sit with this morning's speakers and ask them difficult, penetrating questions. Thank you. Cheers.